Chapter 10, Pure Reason. It must be apparent enough that our professor, as above hinted, is a speculative radical and of the very darkest tinge, acknowledging, for most part, in the solemnities and paraphernalia of civilized life, which we make so much of, nothing but so many cloth rags, turkey poles, and bladdered bladders with dried peas. To linger among such speculations, longer than mere science, requires a discerning public can have no wish. For our purposes, the simple fact that such a naked world is possible may, may actually exist under the clothed one will be sufficient. Much thereof we omit about kings wrestling naked on the green with Carmen and the kings being thrown, dissect them with scalpels, says Teufelsdruck. The same viscera, tissues, livers, lights, and other life tackle are there. Examine their spiritual mechanism. The same great need, great greed, little faculty. Go on. Don't, I don't want to play. No, go on. Great greed and little faculty, nay, ten to one, but the carman, who understands draught cattle, the rimming of wheels, something of laws of unstable and stable equilibrium, with other branches of wagon science, has actually put forth his hand and operated on nature, is the more cunningly gifted of the two. Whence, then there, so unspeakable difference. From close... Much also shall we admit, omit about confusion of ranks and Joan and my lady, and how it would be everywhere. Hail, fellow, well met, and the chaos come again. All which to any one that has space that has once fairly pictured out the grandmother idea, society in a state of nakedness, will spontaneously suggest itself. Should some skeptical individual still entertain doubts whether in a world without clothes the smallest politeness, polity, or even police could exist, let him turn to the original volume and view the boundless Serbonian Cer bog of Sanskulatism, stretching sour and pestilential, over which we have lightly flown, where only whole armies but whole nations might sink. If indeed the following argument, in its brief riveting emphasis, be not one of itself incontrovertible incontro and final. Are we opossums? Have we natural pouches like the kangaroo? Or how, without clothes, could we possess the master organ, soul seat, the true pineal gland of the body social, I mean, a purse? Nevertheless, it is impossible to hate Professor Teufelstrock. At worst, one knows whether or not to hate or to love him. For though, in looking at the fair tapestry of human life, with its royal and even sacred figures, he dwells not on the obverse alone but here chiefly in the reverse, and indeed turns out the rough seams, tatters, manifold thrums of that unsightly wrong side, with the almost diabolic patience and indifference, which must have sunk him in the estimation of most readers. There is that within unspeakably distinguishes him from all other past and present sans culottes. The grand unparalleled peculiarity of Teufelsdrock is, with all that... <laughs> that with all this descendentalism, he combines a transcendentalism no less superlative, whereby if one hand he degrade the man below, below most animals, except those jacketed gouda cows, he on the other exalts to him, exalt him beyond the visible heavens, almost to an equality with the gods. To the eye of vulgar logic, says he, what is man? An omnivorous biped that wears breeches, to the eye of pure reason, what is he? A soul, a spirit, a divine apparition? Round his mysterious me, there lies under all those wool rags a garment of flesh or of senses, contextured in the loom of heaven, whereby he is revealed to his light and dwells within with them union and division and sees and fashions himself a universe with azure starry spaces, the and long thousands of years deep hidden he is, is he under that strange garment, amid souls and colors and forms, as it were, swathed in and inextricably overshrouded. Yet it is sky-woven and worthy of a god. Stands he not thereby in the center of immensities, in the conflux eternities? He feels power has been given to him to believe, nay does the spirit of love, free in its celestial primeval brightness, 
even here, though but for moments, look through. Well said, St. Chrysostom, with the lips of gold, the true Shekinah is men. Where else is the God's presence manifested, not to our eyes only, but to our hearts as in our fellow man? In such passages, unhappily too rare, the high platonic mysticism of our author, which is perhaps the fundamental element of his nature, bursts forth, as it were, in full flood, and through all vapor and tarnish of what is often so perverse, so mean in his exterior environment, we seem to look into a whole inward sea of light and love, though, alas, the grime coppery clouds soon roll together again and hide from it from view. Such a tendency to mysticism is everywhere traceable in this man, and indeed to attentive readers must have been long ago apparent. Nothing that he sees but has more than common meaning must have been long ago apparent. And oh, sorry, nothing that he sees but has more than a common meaning as the, in the poorest ox goad, but has two meanings. Thus, if in the highest imperial scepter in Charlemagne mantle, as well in the poorest ox goat and gypsy blanket, he finds prose, decay, contemptibility. There is in each sort poetry also and reverend worth. For matter, were it never so despicable, is spirit, the manifestation of spirit. Were it never so honorable, can it be more? The thing visible, nay, the thing imagined, the thing in any way conceived is visible, what is but a garment, a clothing of the higher celestial invisible, unimaginable, formless, dark with excess of bright, under which a point of view of the following passage, so strained in purport, so strange in phrase, seems characteristic enough. The beginning of all wisdom is to look fixedly on clothes, or even with the armaments eyesight till they become till they become transparent the philosopher says the wisest of this age must station himself in the middle how true the philosopher is he to whom the highest has descended and the lowest has mounted up who is equal and kindly brother of all shall we tremble before cloth webs and cobwebs whether woven in our great looms or by the silent arachnes that we weave unrestingly in our imagination or, on the other hand, what is that we cannot love, since all was created by God? Happy he can who happy he who can look through the clothes of man, the woolen and fleshy and official bank paper and state paper clothes, into the man himself, and discern it may be in this or the other dread potent, more or less incompetent digestive apparatus, yet also an inscrutable, venerable mystery in the meanest tinker that sees with eyes. For the rest, as is natural to man of this kind, he deals with, deals much in the feeling of wonder, insists on the necessity and high worth of universal wonder, which he holds to be the only reasonable temper of, for the denizen of so singular a planet as ours. Wonder, says he, is the basis of worship. The reign of wonder is perennial and indestructible in man. Only at certain stages, as the present, it is, for some short season, a reign in partibus infidelium. The progress of science, which is to destroy wonder and its stead substitute mensuration and numeration, finds small favor with Teufelsdrock, much as he otherwise venerates those two latter processes. Shall your science, exclaims he, proceed in the smallest chink-lighted or ever oil-lighted underground workshop of logic alone, and man's mind become an arithmetical arith, 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 mill, whereof what you call political economy are the meal? And what is that science which the scientific had alone, were it screwed off, and, like the doctors in the Arabian tale, set in a basin to keep it alive, could prosecute without a shadow of a heart, but one of one other of the mechanical and menial handicrafts for which the scientific head, having the soul in it, is too noble an organ? I mean that the thought without reverence is barren, perhaps poisonous at best, dies like cookery with the day it, that it called forth, that called it forth, does not live like sowing in successive tilts and wider spreading harvests, bringing food and plenteous increase to all time. 
In such wise does Teufelstruck deal hit, harder or softer, according to ability, yet ever as we are trouble pipe scoffers and professed enemies to wonder, who in these days so numerously patrol as night constables about the Mechanics Institute of Science and cackle like true old Roman geese and goslings round their capital on any alarm or on none. Nay, who often, as illuminated skeptics, walk abroad into peaceable society in full daylight with rattle lantern and insist in guiding you and guarding you there with the sun is shining in the street populous with mere justice loving men that the whole class inexpressibly wearies into him hear what uncommon animation he perorates the man who cannot wonder who does not habitually wonder and worship were he president of innumerable royal societies and carried the whole mechanique celeste and hegel's philosophy the epitome of all laboratories and observatories with their results in his single head is but a pair of spectacles behind which there is no eye let those who have eyes look through him and he then he may be useful thou wilt have no mystery and mysticism wilt walk through thy world by thy sunshine of what thou callest truth, or even the hand lamp of what I call attorney logic, and explain all, unfathomable, all pervading domain of mystery, which is everywhere under our feet, among our hands, to whom the universe is an oracle and a temple, as well as a kitchen and a cattle stall. He shall be delirious mystic, to him thou, with sniffing clarity, wilt protrusively proffer thy hand lamp and shriek, as one injured when he kicks his foot through it. Armer Teufel, doth not thy cow calf, doth not thy bull gender, thou thyself wert thou born, wilt thou not die? Explain me all this, or do one of two things, retire into private places with thy foolish cackle, or were better give up and weep, not that the reign of wonder is done, God's world all disembellished and prosaic, but that thou hitherto art a dilettante and sand-blind pedant.'